Our scripture lesson today is coming from Matthew chapter 11. So there's a pew Bible in front of you if you'd like to read along. Um, I will remind you, I read my Bible on my phone. That's a legitimate way to connect with scripture. So that's what I'm going to do this morning. Um, But as you prepare that, we're in Matthew 11. That's in the New Testament. We are in the midst of a sermon series called Everyday Life. And what we've been doing over these past several weeks is exploring how our faith meets some of the most common experiences of our everyday lives. So every day we go through change. Every day we experience fear. We make mistakes. Every every day there's an opportunity for growth. And what we believe is that we can leverage those moments for change, for transformation, um, to grow closer to God. We, We really want to be the kinds of people who recognize the presence of God's goodness and God's truth in the midst of our everyday experiences, not just looking for God when big stuff happens to us, which it will, but also being reminded to look for God in the midst of our everyday lives. So if you want to listen or listen again, Uh, We have a sermon podcast. We're on Facebook, on the website. You can uh, listen or listen again to any of those conversations. So we're in Matthew chapter 11, and I'm beginning at verse 20. Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 20. This is what Jesus has to say. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted in heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been remained until this day. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Dear friends, this is the word of God from long ago for all God's people today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, here we are gathered together as your people today. We long to continue to hear your voice. Would you speak through these words? Speak through our reflections, speak through our silence, that all we do and say might bring us closer to you, that all we hear and receive might make us more your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a couple scenarios for you. Dinner was scheduled in my house at 6.30 p.m. What about y'all? 6.30, around about there, 8.45, something like that. Without fail, at least one person in our household was not there on time. Without fail. What was the result? Number one, somebody got cold dinner, but somebody's feelings were hurt. Somebody got disappointed. Their grocery list was carefully prepared to eliminate multiple trips to Kroger. Who loves going to Kroger 17 times? Anybody? Everybody, somebody, somebody loves it. And yet you get distracted when you go to the store. One of the parents in my household, I'm not going to call anybody out, we're online, but one of the parents in my household got the grocery list, one of them wrote it, and one of them took it to the store, and still, without fail, a key ingredient gets missed. What's the result? Somebody feels angry. The dinner doesn't get done like it should. Somebody is disappointed. 
Or maybe this is your scenario like it is mine. You promise yourself that this time you will not leave that project until the last minute. No, you won't. You are going to get it done early, that you're going to do your research for your paper at least two days ahead of time, and yet there you are at 12 a.m. typing furiously away on your computer, working until the wee hours. The result is that you get frustrated with yourself. You get disappointed. Friends, disappointment happens in our everyday lives. Maybe it's somebody else who has disappointed you. Maybe it's you who are a disappointment to them. Maybe you are disappointed in yourself. Disappointment happens. Jesus got disappointed. Did you catch that in the scripture today? This is where we meet him in Matthew's gospel. This is Jesus expressing an incredibly human emotion. He's here expressing disappointment in a way that only Jesus, who is the son of God, can. Why? Why is he disappointed? Because the people are not doing something that he deeply hopes that they will do. So here's the scene. Jesus has been doing deeds of power all over the place. All over the place. In Chorazin, this is where he preaches the good news about God's coming kingdom. In Capernaum, he heals the Roman centurion's servant. And he heals a man with paralysis. In Bethsaida, he heals a man who is blind. And that's where he feeds the 5,000. But what resulted? What resulted? Some folks listened to his words. A lot more people followed him around, probably because they were really curious about this guy and what he was doing, and they wanted to see what he was going to do next. But there are very few people, Jesus knows, who have actually responded to what they have heard. There are very few people who have moved away from doing things that don't bring them life. That's what repentance really means, friends. It's a big, fancy word that freaks us out in the church sometimes, but that's all it means. Repent means to turn away from the stuff that you are doing that is not toward God, that doesn't bring you life, and turn back toward God and the things that do bring life. And so few, Jesus knows, had actually moved in trust away from self and toward God. So we hear Jesus say, whoa, Whoa, that's a really great word that you only find in the Bible. There's a gap. That's what's happening. There's a gap between Jesus' expectation for folks and between their reality. There's a gap between expectation and reality. And so there is disappointment. That's why disappointment happens, because there is a gap between our expectations, in other words, what we hope or what we believe or what we desperately long to have happen, and the reality, which is what actually happens. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you have a vision for the way that things in your future will play out. Your love story is going to be just like you see in the movies. Your kids are going to turn out like a parenting expert's dream. Your savings account will be big. Your credit card balance will be small. Your vacation schedule will be the envy of every person who follows you on Instagram. Your promotion schedule at work will be straight out of a textbook, straight to the top. Your friends will be as loyal to you in adulthood as they were in kindergarten. Your daily news feed will be full of stellar reports of economic growth. Somebody say amen. <laughs> of peace in every neighborhood, of peace between every nation. Somebody say amen. Peace between every group of people. Our church will be the model of servanthood in our community. Our pews will always be full. Even in smaller things, our daily schedule will go exactly according to plan, without fail, down to the minute, without interruption. Our sleep schedule will be smooth and regular and uninterrupted. <laughs> our commute without a speed trap, without an atrocious driver in sight. These are the visions we hold for how things will happen in our lives. This is what we think will make us happy. How's it working out? Don't get me wrong. Expectations, they can be good for us. They can be motivating. They can help us reach our goals. They can help us direct our lives toward good things through 
thought patterns and behaviors that serve us well and that help us out, but expectations can also harm us because sooner or later, expectations will lead to disappointment when our expected outcome don't match our actual outcome. Disappointment is what happens when there's a gap between our expectation and our reality. And we all have these disappointments in our lives and we all have a different reaction to them. Some of us feel frustrated. Some of us feel angry or sad. Some of us feel hurt or resentful. Maybe we feel that way toward ourselves. Maybe we feel that way toward another person. Maybe we feel that way toward God. It's easy to get stuck in the disappointment. It's easy to get stuck in the disappointment we feel. We hold on to that unforgiveness toward ourselves, toward others, towards God. Maybe we refuse to let go of that particular time that somebody didn't measure up to our expectations or we refuse to let ourselves off the hook. Maybe we keep a running list, not only of the ways that somebody disappointed us 15 minutes ago and an hour ago and a day ago and a month ago, but also how they disappointed us a year ago and 15 years ago. Maybe you keep a running list for God of all of the ways that you hoped and expected that God would show up for you that God did not. Your perception of disappointment. We can get stuck in our disappointments, friends. We can use them as a reminder, as proof for why we are not or why that other person is not or why God is not worthy of trust. And so as we encounter this scripture today, what we recognize is that we have a choice. We have a choice of whether or not to get stuck. There's two ways that we could go. We could get stuck in our disappointment or we could go a different way. I found a really short video illustration of what it might look like to go a different way on TikTok a couple weeks ago. Here's a snowball fight that happened in London. Those commuters in London had a vision for how their day was going to go. It was not going to have any snow on the train tracks, but then guess what? The snow showed up. And so they had a choice on that train station platform when their uh, train got delayed. Sit around and grumble about the delay in service and about the disruption to their schedules or have a snowball fight. Friends, stuck is not the life that God has called us to. We're so thankful that we have this opportunity to see how Jesus deals with the disappointments that he experiences. So let's move through the scripture and just see how he encounters a moment of disappointment. So first he acknowledges it. Jesus acknowledges it. He feels his feeling. Please, church, let us not discount the importance of feeling your feeling before the Lord. (laughs) Whoa, Jesus says. This is, if if your Bible's still open, this is in verse 20. Jesus faces his feeling of disappointment head on. You can almost hear him thinking, this is not going the way I hoped it would. This is not going the way I hoped it would. People are not turning to God with gratitude and loyalty and trust and repentance because of what God has done for them through me. So Jesus faces his feeling of disappointment head on. He feels his feeling and he expresses it. But then, friends, notice that there is a next. This is not where Jesus stays. He doesn't get stuck there. Look at verse 25. In the midst of his disappointment, he grounds himself in his relationship with God, his Father. He grounds himself in his relationship. He says, God, you know what? No matter what happens, you know me, and I know you, and I trust you. So first he expresses and acknowledges Then he turns in trust to God. And then look what he does next. Look there in verse 28. He grounds himself in God, and that allows him to move toward love. What does he say? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Do you know this one? And I will give you rest. Jesus reaches out to the people who have disappointed them in love. Now notice, friends, he does not start there. This is not a scriptural encouragement 
to push down your feelings and just to move toward love right away. But love is the direction that we are going. It's not where Jesus starts, but it's where he ends up. And so there is stuff for us to learn. There's stuff for us to learn from his life and how he reacts to things. And the first thing for us to learn is to be proactive. It's really, really important for us to manage our expectations. It's important for us to bring our expectations and our reality as close together as possible. Oftentimes we get disappointed because what we expect is wildly improbable. Wildly improbable. No wonder we get disappointed. We expect a lot. Sometimes we cause our own disappointment. It's important to acknowledge that. So part of our work is proactive in recalibrating our expectations, but part of our work is also reactive. So once the disappointment has happened, how can I follow Jesus' lead to deal with the disappointment that I am experiencing? And so I think that there is a set of questions that we might ask ourselves, a set of questions that we might ask ourselves first. How is God inviting me? All of this is an invitation. How is God inviting me? How is God inviting us in this moment to feel our feelings? How is God, in me, God inviting me to feel my feelings, to recognize when I feel disappointed? How am I being invited to seek to discover why I'm disappointed? There's a, so there's an invitation to discover and to ask ourselves why. There's an invitation to ask ourselves, how is God inviting me to express my disappointment? Sometimes it's not healthy to do that. And so in that moment, you can express it to God. That's what Jesus does. You can express it to God, but if it's appropriate, you might express it to yourself or to the person who has disappointed you. How can we express our feelings? That's an invitation. Next, there might be an invitation to, um, to trust God, that even in the midst of disappointment, God is good. Maybe God is inviting you to trust. And finally, there's an invitation to move forward in love, not to get stuck. To feel how we feel, to express how we feel, to share it with God or share it with another person, to turn back to God in trust, and to move forward in love. This is the invitation. I don't know where you are today. You might be at that first step. You might be at that fourth one. You might be somewhere in between. But here's the good news. No matter where you are personally, even when Jesus is disappointed, even when folks aren't doing what he deeply longs for them to do, what does he do? He extends his grace to them. He moves from this place of proclaiming woe toward offering rest. And his invitation is for everyone who hears his voice. His invitation is inclusive. And all we need to do on our part is respond to the invitation he issues. This invitation that he issues to feel our feelings, to express our disappointment, to trust God, and to move forward. Once we respond, all he says to us is that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's good news that before we do any of this for another person, he does it for us. That's grace. So it's our human nature to feel sadness. It's our human nature to feel hurt, to feel frustrated when we are disappointed, when our expectation and when the reality don't match up. But God in God's grace offers us the opportunity to follow Jesus, to follow his leadership, to examine our feelings, to express them, to turn to with to God in trust and to choose to keep on loving and serving each other even in the midst of our disappointment. Friends, may it be so in our life together. Amen.